Hello, folks. Welcome back to the Wasted Possession Podcast. This is me, Rish. I'm joined by my fellow co-hosts. I'll go like... first. <laughs> Ali, Alistair. This has been a while since we got together and had a talk, so it's all right to be back. Uh, let's grind out that YouTube content. <laughs> and yeah, it's uh, Nahian, also known as Thermal. And um, yeah, it's, it's, good, it's good to be back. We obviously haven't done a Euros Copa special, Copa America special yet, so or episode yet, I should say. So yeah, yeah, awesome. So obviously, you guys, congratulations to all the English fans out there. Congratulations to you two. You guys are in the semi-finals, playing in a few days. How are you feeling? I feel like uh, it's coming home, lads. <laughs> nah, to be fair, like. I was I was very skeptical of Southgate at the start, but as it, the the tournament's gone on, and obviously we got the big win against Germany, which was I think everyone after the game was saying, yeah, boy, it was a it was a it was, it was a trash German team. There was a German team that hasn't been as good as previous. But before the game, everyone was saying, you really think you're going to beat this German team? Look what they did to Portugal! Blah 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 blah. So you know, um, I think I think we did what we had to do there, got the massive win. Um, and we can definitely carry that bad boy forward um, into the rest of the tournament, I feel. Um, obviously, you'd expect us to get past Denmark, who have been really good in spite of what's happened to, obviously, Christian Eriksen um, earlier on in the in the tournament. But um, yeah, I think we'll get to the final. I think Italy have a much better team than us, man for man and as a unit. Uh, but I think the one thing I haven't or no one previously gave Southgate credit for is getting it tactically right in the games he's in. Um, and I think he proved that when we played Germany and we had quite a different tactical um, setup and formation. And um, they just didn't really threaten us at all, except for that Muller chance, which is off the back of Raheem Sterling's mistake. So, you know, I think we're in a really good position and it's it's genuinely a feasible outcome for England to win it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in the group stages... There were a few iffy performances, but then if you look at those teams we had those iffy performances against, you look at Czech Republic, um, they went on to beat Netherlands, obviously didn't get through Denmark, but you could tell that you know th- th- those 1-0 wins were actually really good performances in hindsight, because Croatia obviously gave um, Spain a very good game, and, and Germany, I think, it, it had Germany probably one of the strongest teams in the tournament. And um, yeah, to win that in in the way we did it, it was a very, it was a very, it felt like a season performance. Mm. Although I think we so. don't have, although we 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 haven't really been up against, well, we haven't won those big games in the past. But um, last week, last Tuesday, it felt like an experienced performance. I think for the other game, Spain, I, I think Spain could shock a few people. They've dominated every game. Um, they they haven't taken their chances, but they probably from a performance perspective, I mean they have it in them to dominate Italy. Whether they can get the goals or not is a different story. Mm, and I think I think it's important that um, we draw up on them one nil wins. Sorry, I tried to interrupt you there. I thought you were done. <laughs> um, but um, you know the teams that we were playing were very defensive minded, defensive orientated, and particularly Scotland were very fired up. Now the first time we come up against a team that isn't set up like that, which is Germany comfortable to know when could have been more we missed a few opportunities then obviously ukraine probably would have gone the same way as um croatia and um czech republic games if it wasn't for the fact that we got a goal in the fourth minute and it was a case of you know if if say for example croatia lost in the group like they did they could afford it maybe you know let's not um, can see too many keep confidence high etc etc um whereas Coming in to that Ukraine game, obviously Ukraine then have to try and play, uh, which obviously opened up the game a lot more, which is something that, you know, maybe we didn't um, have the opportunity to do because teams could afford to drop points. They can't afford to not win games now. Um, so, yeah, going going forward, I think, you know, not conceded yet. That's a massive one, especially when you got man like Jordan Pickford in goals with all the, um, <laughs> you know, the, all the stuff that have been thrown at him. Um, you know, Maguire and Stones, two questionable centre-backs, apparently. Um, I, th- I think um, Maguire's performances have been really good when he's come on. Um, I think it highlights the problem that um, 
Manchester United have, you know, why is he not replicating that from Manchester United? I think it's highlighting the fact that he just doesn't have a competent defensive partner there. Now, Stones is a really good player. Um, you partner him with Diaz and he's world class, but that was my inkling that what Stones going to do with Diaz. It just turns out that Maguire needed somebody who can pretty much actually defend um, next to him in order to perform. And I think that was backed up by, um, you know, that late um, Ukraine goal against Sweden was 100% poor defensive positioning and um, mentality mentality from um, Lindelof. So I'm quite excited to see if we do bring in a competent centre-back, what it means for us. But again, this isn't a Manchester United conversation. We're talking about the Euros. Um, but yeah, it's been a great tournament so far. Loads of loads of different, um, you know, twists and turns with France, the Netherlands. And I'm probably missing something. <laughs> Someone else as well. Yeah. No, so basically... What I really find interesting about the way the semifinals are shaped up is that you have two very like practical teams, right? In in England and Denmark, right? Like their their primary objective is we're not going to concede, right? Mm. We're going to win the game. We're going to take the few chances we get. We're going to try to be efficient with it, but we're basically not going to concede. And then you have these two like idealistic teams, and I really shouldn't say idealistic because Spain plays basically with Morata, who he's like Morata. Morata is, he's not really trying to score. He's more there as like a pressing forward. Basically, he's a false nine. Yeah, effectively, right? And but but even then, like the way just Spain plays is just, is just beautiful. It's just idealistic. It's just like Mwah, right. And Italy, <laughs> Italy is doing that. <laughs> what is like Tiki Italia, right? So whatever happens, the final is going to be this battle between like the pragmatic and like the idealistic side of the game. And and what we've we've always had this narrative, right? That in international football, except for that Spain team from 2008 to 2012, we really don't see idealistic football like have success. Like if even if you look at France, the most talented team, like Pogba is out here basically not going, not making <laughs> those deep runs into the box. He's staying back even when we had the chance. Instead, he's looking for a pass because he knows he needs to be there to defend, right? And and that just goes for. I mean, that just goes for most international sides in general who are successful, right? They're very, very pragmatic. It's just Jose Mourinho football. You know what I mean? Just yeah, we're gonna defend till we die. Yeah, I mean, like I, I agree with with what you're saying. I, I think to compare it, so so the Spain team you mentioned in 2008 and 12, that that team was the perfect team. But I think it's a bit harsh to, to say about England where where the, where the focus is not to concede. I think we've just been very good at defending. I, we, we we took the game to Germany. One one uh, not necessarily take take the game, but deserved winners certainly had control of that game. And um yeah, I think I think in the final I I don't I don't see sort of us waiting for a counter versus Italy. I think I think we could really take the game. Take the game no, to no. either of them. But we have to take oh, sorry. we have to take we have to get best Denmark first. So yeah, I guess that's I I, I I I was agreeing with you until you said maybe not take the game to Germany. We absolutely took the game to them. If you look at the heat map of the likes of Gosens and I think it was Kimmich on the right on right wing back, the difference in that England game compared to the other games they've played in terms of the heat map and where they were positioned, um, the heat map was predominantly in the opposition half against everyone else but England. Against England, it was well back. There was hardly any streaks of heat going forward and I think England just absolutely nullified them um, identify that that's where the threat is um, and came up with something that was sturdy against it but also gave them you know Germany something to question in terms of opportunities going the other way apart from that first 10 minutes that first 10 minutes I was like oh well <laughs> we're done um, but then obviously the game took a bit of rhythm England took control and it was really really good to see now are we going to be able to do that against Italy I'm not sure I think their fourth style of play is a lot more intelligent um but at the same time I think if anyone is going to topple that Italian team in terms of out tactic them I don't think out of the teams that are remaining you you can look past anyone other than England because the way the team set up against everyone they've played so far has been completely sort of different, dependent on the ability level of the other team, and it's worked every time. Maybe not against Scotland. I think we should have beat Scotland. Um, I, we knew they had to be fired up for it. You know, Stones should have scored um, that early opportunity, and then I think Scotland's aim was to not lose against England. So you know, 
you're pointing to Scott McTominay at centre back says it all, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I think um, they've handled it quite well and they've shown that they can switch and uh, adapt to whatever another CR side is throwing at them. Yeah, I mean, like by, by what you said, it sounds like we agree here. It's just that our definition of what we see as taking the game to someone is is a little bit different. Yeah. But yeah, we control the game. Um, but what I want is for the both of you, for, for your predictions for well, both the semi-finals, starting with Italy and Spain. Um, I'm I'm I, I, I'm go. I feel like Spain are a bit flimsy at the back, which which c- could cost them. I feel like when, whenever they they they've dominated a lot of their games, but they haven't really been tested. And when they were when they did play Croatia, they 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 struggled in the groups. They struggled. So, I, but I think it's I think it's a very like, I can't pick a winner, but I'm inclined to say Italy. Mm, you go first, Rish. Honestly, look for me. I remember I remember when I was doing like the whole bracket thing before the thing started. I predicted Belgium versus Italy, and I thought to myself, "Wow, like the golden generation versus this, you know, Tiki Italia, this <laughs> kind of unique Italian team." And then I thought to myself, "Wait, this is going to be Mancini versus Martinez. Yeah, Mancini's going to win. You know what I mean?" And the thing is. This 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 game against Spain, it's Mancini versus Enrique, right? <laughs> like, like if if you want to see like the two great coaches who can who can really put up a fight, you know, like Enrique, if you remember again in that uh, game against PSG when they conceded four, he said if they can put four past us, we can put six. We can put six past them. Guess what happened? They put six past them, right? Like Enrique, like he, if someone is gonna beat Mancini, I think right now. Uh, I mean, yes, England could do it because England, I think, have, has a better squad than Spain right now overall. But I think Enrique, man, he is, he's probably like, he's probably one of the best top five coaches in the world right now. And, and don't get me wrong, Mancini is still great. Mancini is Mancini. He's, he's, yeah. he's, you know, unquestionable. But like the, this game is going to be a difficult one. I, but I, I do agree that Spain is going to struggle defensively despite having Laporta. I think, I think, I, I just don't think Jose Unai Nunez, who's their goalie? When I knew, no, not when Unai I knew. Simon. Yeah, she Unai won. Simone, Simone, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, nah, I don't. I just, I, I, Eric Garcia is okay as well, but like, come on, he he doesn't really get had has had like a full proper season of top five football, right? Yeah. So for that reason, I don't think that Spain is gonna be able to make it through. But at the same time, I do expect that the goal line the score line is probably gonna be like something like maybe three one for Italy. Hmm. Uh, I'm. Yeah. I'm feeling Italy as well. I think I've heard a lot of talk about Spinozola being out. Um, people forget that it was Eder who I barely played for his club in 2017, 18 season, scored the winner for Portugal to bring the trophy home for them. So I don't, I don't believe that'll be that much of a factor. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it'll be Italy's. I think the problem with Spain, I don't think they're going to be able to have that sort of dominance on the wings that they've had because they're relying on their wide players to get the goals. Um, I don't think Italy will allow that. I think they're going to be very tight at the back. And without a proper outlet for a striker, you're not going to be able to... I I can't see Morata doing a job against Bonucci or Chiellini. That's not Morata's job, right? No, no, no. You're right. You're right. That's not his job. But ultimately... Italy are going to be too tight for them to fully thrive on the wing that they like that they want to. You're going to need that out and out goal scorer who's going to get maybe two chances in that game and nail them both, and they just don't have that right now. Um, so I I I I don't think Italy are going to concede. I think it's going to be an easy two nil win for Italy. Um, from from that standpoint, I think defensively they might be old, but who cares if they're aging because the tournament's right now in Cialini and Bonucci. Um, I think you know on the on. I think when you look wide, Federico Chiesa is one of the most underrated players in the world right now. He's right. absolutely insane. I, I mean, I think he'd walk into any club in the world. Um, so you know, it's I'm- it it's one of them. A question, a question for you then, Ali. You said it's going to be a game about two chances, but I, I think Spain have created so many chances, and I, I don't think it's that going to be that, like. Do you, what? My question to you is: Do you do 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 you see Spain having ten, twenty chances in that game like they have done in the past? I mean, because if it is two chances, 
I think they can accept that they're going to lose. Who, who? I, I'm saying to like you know, not shot from outside of the box. Actually, well worked routine. Um, who of Italy's quality have they faced yet in this tournament? So nobody, but they, and, they've abs- they've absolutely they've even the games they've drew draw, drawn, but they've absolutely dominated everything. You game. expect that when they come against them. You're not, you know, they've they've that that's nothing. It's like saying, oh, but you know. Manchester United have created chances against the likes of Burnley, Brighton, blah blah blah. It doesn't matter. You're supposed to. That's the, that's that's the minimum. If Enrique's not creating chances against, I don't know, bloody Switzerland or whoever it was they played Austria, I think they they come up against. Um, then you might as well walk out the door right now. Um, at least with the England side, we've shown that we have been able to create those chances against a sturdy defence. Because when you look at that German team, when I think of about you know German football, you always think about massive, strong defenders. That that that's the first thing that comes into my head. Now I think maybe they've branched away from that a little bit. You know, with um, the midfield being relatively impressive, but I think the the strongest part for every German team is the the defence and the keeper, and England broke them down. Uh, Spain haven't had the opportunity to show that they can do that against a world-class competent side like Italy, and I think Italy have the best defence going into this tournament. Um, so it, it's ba- it's like, um, you know, I haven't seen any evidence of why they would be able to break Italy down, so I, I can't, you can't credit them with that. Um, you know, they are creating these opportunities against these teams, but again, you know, they haven't really put them away. You're gonna, if you're having 20 opportunities against Austria, I think in 90 minutes, you're probably going to have a maximum of eight against Italy if you play well. Um, I, I don't think they're going to put them away. They, they're they not going to have the fluidity on the wings and they don't have a number nine. I mean, uh, yeah, I think I, I agree with you that they won't put them away. I think, uh, I mean, re- and usually, if you'd like take the 2018 side of Man City, they dominate the small teams. And when they get to the big teams, it's still domination, but it's not as much. Obviously. And and, and my my point was more if, if if Spain are going to sit, if Spain can't sit on Italy, and if it'll be that sort of game, mm. more, more so if they'll win. But if, if, if Italy are too sexy on the ball for that to happen, in my opinion. That's ultimately it. I can't think yeah. of a better word for it. Just when when you're looking at them, play is just sauce. Um, you know, you got people like Barella in the midfield just orchestrating everything. You've got um, Locatelli, man. Locatelli. Locatelli. I mean, you look at the wings. You know, you've got you've got Chiesa just doing whatever he wants on the ball, and they're able to to finish. So, you know, I think um, I don't think they're going to have the opportunity to settle like they. What you know against I don't know whoever else that there is that they've played, so yeah, I I I I think it's going to be more of a challenge for Spain than Italy, and whether they can overcome that challenge, we haven't seen any evidence of. We've already seen them be a little bit lackluster. Now I know Enrique uses the example, you know, pop the bottle up. You know, we were just fizzing. Now the bottle's been popped. Easy to say that when you haven't played anyone that you'd expect to win the tournament yet, really. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think I think we're all at consensus that Italy is a favorite to go in. I think yeah. that's pretty clear, right? But but come on, man. Enrique, like, it's going to be a war. You know what I mean? Like, Enrique, yeah. he, he doesn't send out his players who, oh, we're going to go out there, get a 2-1 win. We're going to go out there, get a 1-0 win. No, no, no. He goes, we're going to go out there, we're going to go to war. We're going to get four goals past Italy. That's probably what he's telling them right now. He's probably <laughs> telling them all sorts of stuff just to you know pump them up and get them ready to go but i think another manager i think another team actually which is which is going to be quite which has been quite pumped up really in this tournament for you know because i i feel like part of the reason is because the unfortunate circumstances they found themselves in is denmark and i mean i know england is favors going into that matchup with denmark obviously but dude like this is a team which is like which is basically be, being fueled by emotions to some extent, and also like they've played decent, like they've been astute, they've been defensively like that, uh, like their their positioning has been solid, you know, and their midfield, their midfield is, is is doing the work and helping out their defense, keep you know ensure that you know basically like they're able to create a, a double wall of sorts, right? And Dolberg, Dolberg has been scoring, 
and he's finally he's finally kind of showing i guess once again the world that you know don't forget about dolberg you know because after after he left ix he kind of fell off the face of the earth in terms of mm-hmm. i guess you know popularity i suppose or consensus uh but i think you know i, I think i think this i think this denmark team is kind of special and you know this england team is great don't get me wrong it's clear that they're favorites but I feel like, and I guess this goes for both games. I think there's a chance for upsets in both games. A very good chance. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I I, think Denmark being England is more likely than Spain beating Italy, in my opinion. I, I, to be honest, if it wasn't if it wasn't for the obviously unfortunate thing that happened with Christian Eriksen, I, I'd, I'm not sure Denmark would be in this position. I feel like that sort of event absolutely fueled them. They had that 1-0 loss against Finland in a match that shouldn't have gone ahead, at least for, a, for another day or two. Um, but, you know, what UEFA did, what UEFA did, I guess. Um, and they've carried that with them. And, you know, you look at Hjoberg, um in the last game, obviously breaking down crying. I think that sort of strength um, being translated onto the pitch has helped them go from strength to strength in this tournament. Um, I, I Obviously, you expect England to win. Um, but I don't think we can get too excited by saying we're already in the finals. Denmark will probably be the hardest opposition we come across across that includes Germany um I think Denmark have been playing every game like it's a final uh they've got a really underrated squad as well so I I, I'm definitely not writing them off we should be winning the game I think um we've played better sides on paper perhaps um in maybe Croatia maybe Czech Republic definitely um Germany but obviously they're they're fueled by something completely different that no one else in the history of the Euros has been fueled by. So, you know, there's no sort of barometer for how far that fuel can go. I I, I, w- I, I wouldn't agree that it'd be like I, I would say the Spain game would be less of an upset. I think I think in that game from my side, it's where it's like fifty five towards Italy. Um but that might be different for you guys. But yeah. I I think for Denmark because uh, we're one, we're back at home now, and um, England's home record, England's record at Wembley is very strong, and um, that's I think a, a, a big advantage. I, I think that this game, I mean, it, it doesn't really depend on. I, I think England have the quality to go through, but anything c- can happen, and um, yeah, I know that sort of sounds like me saying something without really saying anything. But I, 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 I do see, I do see England going through to the final. But it'll be really competitive. I don't think it'll be sort of Ukraine sort of game. It, it would be really close. So it'd be more, more, the, more the type of game against Croatia or Czech Republic where it, the, the results being ground out and it's very systematic and yeah. it's it's a well thought out process rather than just going. Yeah, yeah. Both teams. I mean, both teams are absolute dogs in their midfield, man. Like Hoiberg. For Denmark, I mean, he's a tenacious guy. And then, but, you know, and I think this is these two players have been key for England, and that's Rice and Phillips, right? Like, yeah. they have been shields for that defense. And, and like, you know, players like that, sometimes they go unnoticed, but, like, I, th- I think they go less unnoticed nowadays, especially since the likes of Conte and stuff. But, like, if it, despite England having, like, you know, these flashy forwards, Right, I think it's really that that those defensive midfielders and just their ability to just fight basically and make sure that you know the, only, the the chances which are going past them are chances which their defense can easily deal with or has a better chance of dealing with, and and that gives them you know th- that gives those forwards so much confidence and so much just freedom to just be able to roam and do what they want, right? And also it gives comfort to the defenders and, and gives them time to think and plan out how they're going to close down a situation versus, you know, if you if, if your midfielder are just bombing forward, which is kind of what the problem was with England's golden generation, then your defenders, your center backs don't really have that time in the day to plan out, okay, where should I be positioned best? You know, they're kind of just like, okay, I just need to get there ASAP. I don't, you know, I don't care what happens because right now this is priority and I can't think of anything else because this is happening quickly. Right? And, that time and that effort and and just the amount of space basically and then it's and, and the comfort which which everyone gets because of rice and phillips like and, and henderson as well he kind of pops in every now and then right he's been <laughs> off right now but he's, he scored a goal my guy 
Which, I don't think Henderson yeah. starts above Rice nah. and Phillips right now, to yeah. be honest, which is quite a big thing to say. Right. Yeah. I think, I mean, he also has a nagging injury. I would, as a Liverpool fan, Without, I would like him not to start. I would like him to stay healthy, you know, and chill out a bit. I, I, mm. Yeah, I agree with you both on that front. I think without the injury, though, Henderson's one of the best midfielders in the world at any place. But, yeah, I guess I guess before Rish goes on the cover of America, is there, like, one def- one team you guys are picking to win? I think me and Ali are going to be, are going to agree quite a bit on this, but. So, yeah, I mean, I got my my heart saying England, my head saying Italy. To be honest, but you know, I got to back the boys. I think if anyone's going to stun Italy, it would be England. The only issue I can see with um, both sets is I think you've got more natural winners in that Italy team. I think there's more players seasoned to winning those big trophies, being in them finals. Well, other than Sterling, who have England got stones. Doesn't didn't really play um, in years gone by. I mean, this season, yeah, but in seasons gone by, didn't necessarily play too much in those bigger occasions. Um, and obviously, there's the weight of that. Um, and there, I think you know you've got you've got some really really good winners, especially that back to um, uh, um, Italy and Bonucci and Giuliani. That will be very very key to have that sturdy level headedness at the back. I think that's going to be probably the most important factor in that game um so it's just a case of can southgate rally the troops in that regard when they've had no experience in that situation obviously i hope that that they can but i think that's something that's going to account to something should that be the final but that's the final that i'm going to go with so i i want spain to win this one and and is, the reason for this is this this is a team which should not be here, right? Like, if you just go back, you know, rewind to the beginning of this tournament, like, this is a team which was missing Busquets because, you know, COVID. Uh, they had, they had, I think, what, t- two players less in their squad. They took, what, 24 players of the total 26 allowed, right? They barely got to train. Before their, ma- in their warmer game to the Euros, they had to play their U23s because, you know, their senior squad was out because of quarantine, right? Like, this team had everything... Like which could have gone wrong, gone wrong for them, right? But somehow, bro, Luis and, and this is the and not to mention by the way, Laporta, their main center back. This is his first time playing for the Spain, basically, right? So everything which could have gone wrong went wrong. David de Gea, their main goalkeeper, who they were probably hoping would be amazing by this point, you know, is not. He's fallen off. They've had to rely on other parties, and they have a Eric Garcia who's barely played professional football. Let's be honest. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know. But he, he's performing, right? He's doing so decent. They have Morata up top, who everyone hates and doubts at the same time. But, like, he's literally been, along with Busquets, the most important, one of the two most important players in that Spanish squad. And they they have, they, they left behind Sergio Ramos, right? They they, they, they're, they don't have their golden generation anymore with them, except for Busquets. That's pretty much it, right? Like, this is a squad which should not be, right now, doing as well as it has. Yeah, they might have gotten easier opponents, we can say. Perhaps they didn't, you know, if they were going as Belgium rather than Italy, could have been a different story with Italy and Belgium in the semifinal, right? But hmm. that, you know, at the end of the day, you play with the cards you're dealt with. And I want to see them and Denmark, both of them, because I think both of them have a great story, continue to the final and face off. And because I like that story, right? I like the story of these guys who are, who are given the worst hand and they go, okay, fine, we'll still play. And you know, because at the end, at the end of the day, once the whistle blows, right, you're just playing a game of football, and everything else, once the game starts, right, and once the game, like during those ninety minutes, like everything else, like everything else is just noise. It doesn't matter. And I think those two have proven that out of anyone else. I think for me, my heart and head says England. I think we we have it in us to beat Denmark, and I think in the final, I think against Italy, it'll be a grind. I think Spain, it'll be about exposing their fragile defense because because they've made a lot of mistakes. So, yeah, I, I think I think we have it in us to, especially because now both games are at Wembley. Um, no, that that we have a good chance of getting yeah. free. Uh, Best yeah, chance we'll, we'll have for a yeah. long time. I would yeah, add this sure. in my, in my mind, right? So my heart is Spain and and also Denmark in the in the final with Spain winning it, but in in my mind, I think I think England are the favorite. Right, like I, I love Italy. I think Italy is amazing, dude. This England team, right? Like this England team at home, 
right? They've never won this tournament before. They have so much to prove. And I think I think right now with the, just the hunger this team has and Harry Kane and, and Sterling, like, there, there's just so many just quality, like, world-class players. Like, Italy has world-class players, so don't get me wrong. But, dude, England, pretty much every single position is just boom, boom, Premier League winner, you know, freaking even in Henderson, Champions League winner, right? Or, you know, it's challenging for Premier League. Like, these guys are playing in the best league in the world on a daily basis. They're being coached by some of the best coaches in the world. And they're going off against each battling coaches and teams who are some of the best in the world. Like, this is the golden era of the Premier League. Like, yeah. And, and I think it's now under Southgate, who's a pragmatic coach who understands, like, hey, we need to be able to build a solid defense and be solid tactically in that department before we can, you know, look to go and try to attack. And the thing is, these guys have great attack, right? Like, like they can afford to be as defensive as they want because they have some of the best attackers in the world. So, I, I think because of all that combined, I feel like this this England team is going to do it. Keep Anyways. the faith. Keep the faith. <laughs> do you want to um, go um, through um, what, what's been going on in the Copa America, Rish? So, the, give us the lowdown for someone who hasn't watched it. <laughs> so, so, the Copa America obviously started off I think in the most Copa America way possible, which was big protests and, you know, basically the, the Copa, so originally it was going to take place, I think, in Colombia. And then it was decided that Argentina wanted to clean up its image or something. And so, like, a, you know, a little bit of collusion later, it's uh, it's taking place both in Colombia and Argentina. But then it turns out COVID. So, hey, we're going to move it now to Brazil at the last moment, which is the worst hit country in South America. Right. And whose president that basically was an anti vaxxer, right? Yeah. But and obviously <laughs> protests going on, empty stadiums and but but the Copa goes on, right? And that's kind of what the Copa is known for. It's it's just madness. And honestly, like so a few a few key things. First of all, this Argentina team is <laughs> is freaking special, dude. I, I love this Argentina team. <laughs> right? It's it's basically Diego Simeone. Yeah, it's basically Diego, if, as if you just took Diego Simeone's brain and you just suddenly plopped it on there. You know, obviously not perfect. You know, I think, like, for example, against against Ecuador, they probably should have conceded at least two or three goals. There were some good chances missed by Antonio Valencia. Um, and even against Chile, like, they were able to, like, grind out a victory, which which I think is a big deal because Chile is one of those teams which is difficult to beat. But this is not that same Chile squad which won the Copa America back in 2015 and before. And against... Um, Uruguay, I mean, I think against Uruguay, they probably look the best. But once again, this Uruguay team, despite being, you know, having talent, is just, yeah, they're kind of, they were kind of lackluster, honestly. Mm, and right? the big players are aging as well. Exactly. I mean, they have Fede Valverde and stuff, but he was playing out on the wing and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's one of those things. But ultimately, right, this is kind of a, a weak era in, suppose, in in South America compared to what we were used to in the past, where every team was just stacked, right? Like in this era, clearly Brazil are just you know top notch above everyone else, and and Argentina are basically that second team. But here's the thing, and and this is why I I like Argentina so much, and why I think they finally have a chance of winning, is because they have you know they have the, the Trinity. They have Messi, they have De Paul, and they have Martinez, and like these three guys. I mean, sheesh. Okay, first of all, Messi. Messi's Messi, right? Nothing yeah, more to say on that. Said. <laughs> right? But De Paul, man, this guy's a revelation. So he's actually moving to Atletico Madrid, I'm, I'm pretty sure, this uh, window. Is he the and one who plays for Udinese? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's basically the perfect, like, Diego Simeone player. He's tenacious. He he, bas- he, co- he covers, he screens for the defense really well. But most importantly, he can, he can yes, he's, he's great positionally, tactically, defensively. But he's very good at setting up those attacks quickly. He's like Busquets, but better defense, better positioning, in that sense. And like, yes, Busquets is better as a in terms of like being able to pass the ball out and create those attacks overall, right? But this guy, you know, he, if if you were to take Conte and Busquets and kind of find a medium between the two, you would get Depaul. He's okay. excellent, and I think he's pretty much the the player which Argentina had been missing in their midfield for a long time, right? Because Argentina always had these very creative players, very talented players, but they never had this one guy who just just fight for that ball just in the midfield like Conte does, and then also from the, from that midfield create the attack. Usually you ta- you had like Messi dropping down or Di Maria dropping down to the midfield to try to pick up the ball and create that attack, and that just 
that kind of, you know, takes away from the point of having one of the best attacks in the world. You want your attackers up top, you know, engaging in the final third, ideally, and not in, in your own final third, picking up the ball. DePaul, he takes that pressure away. Now he, he's doing that for them. And then Martinez, Martinez all is always dangerous. He's fast. He's clinical. He scored a goal, uh, I think, yesterday against Ecuador. Messi mm-hmm. with two hat tricks yesterday. DePaul with a goal. Messi got a hat. Uh, then Messi also scored a goal. A beautiful free kick. It's just it's a good team. It's firing all cylinders. And here's another thing. And because obviously I talk about these three players, but what I've noticed is this new coach, who's an interim coach by the Scolari. You know, he's he's in that Argentine mold, which Diego Simeone is in, which is just four four two. We defend two great attackers, go do everything else, right? But the thing is, he's basically drilled his team to be something which I suppose previous Argentina teams were not, which is be completely selfless, right? Like, there's a reason why players like Di Maria are only being brought on off the bench. Yeah. Right? It's because, like, he doesn't care if you're a superstar or not. All he cares is, will you do the dirty work of and of be in the right position at the right time and make sure we don't concede, which is the primary goal of the Argentina team? And also... Are you, you know, humble enough to be like, okay, fine, I'll, I'll exchange positions with this left back and go play left back, even though I'm a left winger, because I know by being there, this left back can track his marker better, and I'll go defend, right? I'm gonna give up this chance of trying to go attack and score because I, my team needs me to be back right now, you know, and and that's selfless, that's interplay, that that movement of of that mechanical movement, really. Right and and being just this interlock, this unit, I think this is something which has been missing in Argentina for a while. And now, despite this team being, I suppose, less talented than say like a 2014 team, which went over the World Cup, it's it ha- it is a better team overall. And this coach Scalari, dude, interim coach, if this guy if this guy is able to win the Copa, I mean, even if he doesn't win the Copa America, I hope, I really hope Argentina just hires him full time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then finally, there's Brazil. Brazil is Brazil. I mean, they have everything department. They're booming. They're banging. I mean, they have two of the best goalkeepers around. They have some of the best attackers around. They have great midfielders, great defenders. Thiago Silva. I mean, what a fucking legend. <laughs> they're just, yeah. They're, I, I mean, they're they're honestly the perfect team. A question to to both of you then is is this is this Messi's best chance of winning an international trophy? Because well, he will be in the World Cup next year, but yeah. that will be a little bit well, a much more competitive. It, it's dependent on because I haven't really followed the Cup of America. I've been too busy watching England bring it home. But um, you know, if you know, sort of interim coach that they have now is given that opportunity to then further build the team in a year's time. Who knows what? players he'll have for that point to fit that mold so it is difficult to say um but again you know the competition is going to be a lot harder when you factor in the likes of england um italy particularly england england first because england are going to win it obviously but um (laughs) you know some of the european teams coming in who you know will be able to popify even even a team like belgium who probably disappointed a bit in the euros france who definitely disappointed in these euros portugal who were a bit disappointed again in these euros um you know you put them up against argentina you know is the, the the Gap isn't too big, apart from Messi, obviously. So you know, um, it's just it probably is. I think the Copa America is probably the easier tournament to win. You know, you look at sort of the teams that were in that last eight. If I'm correct, there was the likes of Colombia, Colombia, Uruguay, Peru, and Paraguay in there, along with yeah. you know, Peru and Paraguay don't even qualify for the World Cup a lot of the time. Do you know what I mean? Dude, dude they had uh, a sick game, three <laughs> three, I think. Mm, but that's the thing, you know, that that you've got teams like that in there who are just filler, um, who will not be at the World Cup, or if they are in the World Cup, you don't expect them to get out of the group stage. So I think they have to make this chance count because it's the the level, the golfing quality is just an ocean. I mean, the thing is, like in South America, even like the worst team, which is basically Venezuela, all right, second worst team, right, which is like Ecuador and stuff, like like they're still pretty good. You know what I mean? Like, because this is a continent which just bleeds to this game. Like, in this yeah. continent, like, football is king. That's it, right? Every other thing is, like, second. But, like you said, right, there's a lot more competition at the World Cup. And not just a European competition, but, like, look, dude, we have a pretty sick USA team coming up. We have some pretty good, interesting-looking African teams coming out. 
Also, Asia, dude, like Qatar is actually looking like a decent team, right? I mean, they won the Asian Cup last time around, right? You have you have teams like Japan, which, yes, they're not like world class teams, but like they can do damage. And this time they have a Kubo who's really starting to come up and starting to make some noise, right? And because of that, because of the added competition, I, I don't think, like, despite this Argentina team being something like really nice, really special, I don't know if they have that to be able to, you know win a world cup i think that's just too much of an ask though i would not dis- discredit them or or not discredit i won't like i think they would still be in the running right and we have to remember in this copa america we haven't we haven't seen dibala because well he wasn't even called to the squad right <laughs> and and that's what i mean like there's a lot of like these argentine players big players in europe but also like guys who are currently playing in the argentina league who can just explode at any time right who so given time, who knows, I think maybe if they're sticking with this coach and this coach continues to have success, perhaps he can raise the odds of Argentina doing good at the World Cup. But like that's, you know what I mean? Like that's still not, I don't think that's still enough, right? Like there's just, there's just so many other good teams. So this probably is Messi's best and final chance of winning an international trophy. And look, he's been to, I think, like, what, three or four Copa America finals, right? And last time he went to the final Copa America, lost to Brazil. This mm-hmm. time, it's probably going to be Brazil in the final, right? Unless Peru can do upset tonight, which I, I, I doubt. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but I, I guess. we'll see what happens. I hope Messi gets it. <laughs> I guess then, I guess final two questions. And well, what the first one to both of you? Can, can, what, like one winner like we we did before in Ali, you haven't seen much of it, so you, you can skip that one. But but for Resh, is there? Yeah. Uh, I mean, if, I'll is, go first because mine will be mine will be mine will be shorter. I think on paper it's got to be Brazil, but then again, um, I don't like really like Neymar, so I'd rather see Argentina <laughs> win, and it makes the Ronaldo message debate a lot spicier. So yeah, yeah. Um, ideally Colombia just against the odds come in and do the business but that's very unlikely so yeah I'll probably if I was a betting man just looking at the teams on paper I'd probably go Brazil and uh, so okay so for for, for Ish, well a team that you're backing to win and the one player that stood out for you in the tournament it doesn't have to be like the best player just one that's caught your eye fair fair I mean honestly I, I, I'm a big sucker I've sucked up to him enough but I'm gonna suck up to him again DePaul this guy, man, I'm telling you, when you guys see him next year at Atletico in the Champions League, oof, <laughs> you got to him and Nunez. What's the name? Yeah, Darwin Nunez. 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 Yeah, it? Nunez. The two of them together, it's it's gonna be a very dirty midfield. <laughs> I mean, it's it's nasty. When it comes to who I want to win, dude, like I, I'm not a Barcelona fan at all, right? I could care less about Barcelona. Half the time I hate them because they're they're so arrogant, right? I'm a, <laughs> like I'm a Liverpool fan for God's sake, right? But I'm a Messi fanboy through and through, dude. I want Messi to win so bad. Like he he is the greatest player I've ever seen play football. Period. Like to me, it's like I I understand like you know the Messi Ronaldo debate, right? It will rage on forever, right? And it's kind of counterintuitive because like or counterproductive because both players are great, right? You gotta enjoy them too. But to me, I I genuinely do not understand how someone can like. How someone can think that Ronaldo is a better player than Messi? I think he's a, you know, he's a great footballer. I think he's amazing. But to me, like when I say like, and this is just like obviously, obviously, I, I'm I could be wrong because clearly a lot of people think that Ronaldo is better than Messi, right? Or is equal to him, right? But to me, like I'm I, like when I say I'm, I'm when it comes to like my fandom, my love for Messi and his game, I generally do not think there's there has ever been someone who's even close to him, right? Like I generally like. And so for me, like my heart, my mind, every t- every single tournament is always I want if it, you know if the US is not there or if India is not there, I want Messi to win. I want Argentina to win, dude. So for me, so that's going back. And- is India over there? <laughs> <laughs> well, one day India will qualify could. for a World Cup. One day. Yeah, uh, fingers crossed, bro. Sunil Chetri comes out of retirement. Dude, you business. know he has not retired? He surpassed uh, Messi in international goals. I- I'm just talking about how long it's going to be before they qualify. It'll probably oh. be 60. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know what? At least they qualified for Asia last time around. They're in Asia qualification right now. That's true, that's true. So hopefully, hopefully, maybe Fingers we can do something in Asia. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> nah, we'll yeah. see, we'll see. Yeah, but 
Oh, besides that, I guess I guess two two things. Last things, real quick. Uh, Gold Cup is about to start. The U.S. is sending their B and C team. Mexico is sending their C team because they're going to the Olympics. Canada is sending their A team, and they did try to recruit Tamori, by the way, uh, yeah. from England. So there, there's <laughs> there's that. But um, and and also the Olympics are going to start, which is going to be exciting to see. A lot of young players are going to be scouted there. I think, mm-hmm. I especially Mexico. I think there's some special stuff going on there, and and Mexico have stolen a few U.S. dual nationals, so <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I think this this year's Olympics. I, I'm, honestly, I'm looking forward to them. I'm looking forward to yeah. see what the what the U23s got. It should be quite an interesting one. I'm I'm quite interested to see which young players start to emerge. Yeah, and oh, one thing I should say, Daryl DK or Daryl Dyke, uh, for the U.S. he got called up for the Gold Cup. I mean, he's been basically scoring a goal every other game in the MLS. And he mm. has played in the championship for I think Barnsley, and and he got <laughs> and he helped them get uh, what you call it. And they got promoted, right? They got went to the playoffs. Maybe. There, I mean, I know he had a good season with Barnsley, and he was he was like decent, but he's supposedly rumored to move to Europe, and there there are rumors that he might be coming to England. So, okay, if man. if you guys want to see a potential, you know, potential future. Decent, solid, who knows type. I mean, I, I think he's a good player. Uh, <laughs> then you can you can check out the Gold Cup and and see maybe Daryl like future number nine for for the U.S. Perhaps Let's a Premier League. Let's go. We'll see what happens. It should be interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we keep keep an eye out. Keep an eye out for it. But yeah, we'll, we'll be back like later in the week to to discuss the aftermath. Um, so yeah, oh, see, see how these games came out, and then obviously the big final. Both yeah, Sunday. So, yeah. Sunday's going to be good, and obviously, as always, eleventh of July, the um, draft um, premiership finals is going to take place. The biggest finals of the summer. The um, biggest <laughs> season three coming to an end. We got some really good competitors in there, um, so obviously, stay in tune for that, and obviously, stay tuned to the other content that's coming out here. Obviously, we started the kickback; it's been quite successful so far. A lot more in the pipeline. Fingers crossed. I'm in. I'm in the DMs with a few boys, so you know, hopefully, we can get some <laughs> other great content creators in the space um, to to show their faces uh, for us. But um, yeah, that that's all from me. Any of you boys have any final words? No. All right, cool good beans. Luck, good luck, England. Art we don't need luck, luck when we have talent. That's uh, <laughs> all I'm going to say. <laughs> and uh, thank enough. you very much for watching, guys. And we'll catch you all uh, when, whenever you drop in on us next. Yeah, and be sure to leave a rating. Helps us grow. Help us leave the rain. Leave the rain. Leave the rain. Come on, what are you, what are you playing? Leave the rain. Not leaving the rain. Leave the rain.